welcome to the Mortal Art Podcast. I'm your host, Eldin. This is episode 11, Art Dialogues number 2, with Thomas Frizera. He's an experimental archaeologist. I saw his body of work on Instagram page Bonfire Inc. Check it out. It's very interesting. I was impressed by his work and I asked him to have a dialogue with me. Because of geographical distance between us, we had a conversation on Skype. Forgive us the audio quality. Before I begin, there's a Patreon link for the podcast if you want to support me. For the price of a cup of coffee per month, or a donut if you feel like it, you can help this podcast. You can cancel it whenever you want, whenever the money doesn't suit your needs, or if there is an issue with your finances. No strings attached. You can find all the details on Patreon. If you haven't, make sure to subscribe and follow the podcast so you will never miss an episode. I appreciate it. You can reach me at the Immortal Art Podcast at gmail.com. This podcast has Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter page. The art mentioned on this episode will be uploaded there. All the links are included in the episode description. Also, if you like the podcast, rate it on your favorite podcast app or leave a like on YouTube. Thank you. From now on, Patreon subscribers will have a different introduction of the episodes. Ciao, Tomas. <laughs> Ciao. Come stai? Tutto bene, grazie. Benvenuti to the show. Grazie. So, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Thomas. I come from uh, Verona, Italy. And yes, I started uh, to study art uh, with Viking art, a tattoo of Viking art. But I, I sense a feel of, uh, I must dig in it in the art, in the history of art. I start to study uh, barbaric art, pass through Bronze Age of Europe, and finally the Paleolithic art. And the experimental archaeology is a directly consequence of studying the Paleolithic art because you can understand more deeply if you really recreate the artifact of the Paleolithic era. But how did you become interested in Paleolithic archaeology? That was uh, also all uh, a process that wasn't uh, immediate. <laughs> Can you describe to us a process of how do you make these arrowheads? The process starts uh, with uh, the research and study. I search from data from the other archaeologists and the paleoanthropologists. I simply put it into practice. What are the tools or what type of tools and materials do you use? Okay, tools and the materials are very simple, but it's are hard to find. For example, uh, a hammer rock, uh, is, it must be hard and smooth. And the flint, for example, uh, all the type of flint are not good for uh, work with it. The flint is very handy, fluid, because with this you can create very much types of tools. Pointy shirt for engraving, uh, even a small flake to scrub away the fat of the skin. It's not uh, simply a rock. There's a flint that uh, if you try to break it, it blows in a thousand of uh, little pieces and not mm -hmm. uh, in a shiny, smooth, uh, and sharp, uh, huge uh, shard. Sometimes there's a much difference from uh, the um, tools. The Paleolithic tools are better, and sometimes uh, the modern tools uh, are not better, but uh, faster. Mm. So there is a difference between modern and Paleolithic tools. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, obviously. Obviously. <laughs> on your Instagram page, I saw that you do it on your lap. Yes, this is so... the technique. Yes. Sometimes uh, it's difficult to require the right materials or the right tools. And uh, we, without the right tools, uh, it's very difficult to make a simple array. And uh, sometimes uh, I have to uh, use uh, modern uh, tools such as a simple nail on a stick, not much more. 
for example, uh, when you nap in uh, uh, the tiny details, use uh, an antlers of a deer. Yeah. And uh, if you don't have uh, the right antlers with the right point, uh, it's uh, very hard to, to do the work. And yeah. uh, sometimes uh, an antlers is uh, hard to, to find. How long does it take for you to make an arrowhead? Okay, uh, they require much time. For a simple arrowhead, uh, an hour, you start uh, from a big shard, not a tiny shard, uh, average uh, 10 centimeter for an arrowhead. You create uh, an arrowhead of three centimeters and uh, work uh, the energy and the time uh, tells a lot. When you make uh, an arrowhead, you realize uh, that the arrowhead uh, is uh, something special, product uh, of uh, hard work. I only saw that you do arrowheads. Because uh, you need uh, a very big uh, piece of flint and uh, it is uh, hard to find. Do you think that Paleolithic people had also difficulty finding flint? Yes. You can uh, even find a place uh, with uh, a match of a flint, but uh, find the right flint for the right work, that is hard. Is there differences between cultures, tribes, uh, continents? So-so. Mm, Through the old Paleolithic, the pattern is similar. When uh, you go near Neolithic, uh, the culture split. Paleolithic, uh, all the culture look like the same. You can easily check the same roots of the, um, every culture, every tribe. They start to split in the early Paleolithic, like a Gravettian uh, uh, culture and uh, Magdalian culture. But how big is the difference between these types no, of aerophids? Not so much uh, in reality. They got the same process uh, to create it. Uh, but the shape changed uh, a little bit, uh, not uh, so much, because they got the same root of culture. Recognizing the patterns of arrowheads, for example, for me, they would seem similar or almost identical. But for you, maybe you can see small details that I can't. Exactly. I do wonder, do you have some discoveries through your work in the field? Yes, the simple uh, red dot uh, on the cave art. Uh, it's not simple to make uh, a single red dot because uh, you must go into in search of uh, okra and not all the stone of the yellow stone are okra. So you must uh, search it. And when you find it, you must uh, burn it uh, into a red color and then uh, you must ground it uh, to dust to create a pigment. Then you have to add some oil or fat to create the color, the paint. Then you must travel to, <laughs> to the forest in search of a cave. You must explore the cave. You have to find the right spot and then paint something that you want. And all that in an environment full of predators. This is beautiful. You understand uh, how much uh, is important uh, a single red dot uh, for a paleolithic culture. It's fascinating to me that somebody would paint something on the wall of caves, that somebody would take hours and hours of their time instead of providing food yeah. or making tools or collect food or whatever they did. Or create so, a shelter. Yes, exactly. So. Somebody had to take time from that and make art. Why? Why do we have this need of art? And why certain individuals have that need to perform, to paint, or to take a bone and make carvings in it? And uh, I have a lot of more questions. Is there a huge difference between, for example, European, African, and Australian Paleolithic? Oh, yes much more because the culture, the main culture split uh, in uh, different subcultures and uh, every tribe uh, develop uh, their unique uh, spiritualism and uh, art uh, and uh, something else. There are cultural differences, but what do you think? Are there any social differences between these people? One tribe in Europe and one tribe in, let's say, India or China? There's not much evidence of this. 
I think uh, there, there were the same culture that expand uh, around the world. Roots are all the same. But <laughs> do you collaborate with somebody? Uh, yes, uh, it's not an expert of Alolitic art, but it's my friend, Joe, Jose Ant. Shout out to yes. Joe. <laughs> yes, uh, we collaborate uh, with uh, some processes, but I am uh, specialized uh, to the Paleolithic art, uh, and uh, he was uh, specialized uh, to the um, erratic uh, culture, not erratic, but erratic <laughs> culture. Yeah. The people uh, of uh, pre-Roman history in the Alpen. When you have this data from your own work and from your own field, how do you reconstruct these arrowheads? Do you always have a mental image in your head or do you have a pattern that you physically watch and try to replicate? Sometimes one and sometimes the other. If I want to create a perfect replica, I add always a reference. But sometimes if I want to emerge deeply in the experiment, I'm going to do it all with imagination, like they were doing in the Paleolithic era. What do you like more, uh, Paleolithic or Neolithic? No, Paleolithic, because uh, it's more uh, ancient and primal than Neolithic. I studied the Neolithic. It's very interesting. It's much more uh, civilized. They got more complex art uh, with uh, several geometric patterns. And they've got dark archaeomythology. But uh, I prefer the Paleolithic. I prefer all of them, to be honest. For me, <laughs> they, they all have some kind of a interest that is fascinating to me. How do you analyze and interpret results from methodologies that you use? Well, uh, I simply checked the real artifact and uh, it, it was uh, quite similar. Is a good result, <laughs> simply. I never do something only by myself. I have a reference of uh, some study of a famous archaeologist. Yeah. Can you discuss any limitations that may affect the outcomes of your work? The most of that was uh, the time and the energy. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. continue to insist on this, uh, <laughs> on this point because uh, it's very important. For example, uh, one of the longer process uh, is the um, spearhead. And the spearhead uh, is fundamental to hunt fundamental for the surviving. If you don't have time to do that and energy to do it because it's a hard work, it's not simple, you can't uh, eat. Uh, do you hunt, by the way? No, but if I had uh, the opportunity, I will, uh, I will try. Are you going to start with archery? Archery, yes. I, I'm able to shot an arrow, <laughs> but <Yeah>. I'm not <laughs> so good. <laughs> But practice, I don't know. Yeah. But if you start hunting with bow and arrow or even a spear, I don't know. It will be a fantastic experience. <laughs> Are you going to do as Paleolithic people or as a modern bow and arrow? I think I will try to with the Paleolithic method, with a stone spear and arrow and bow. Okay, good luck. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Tell me how that goes. If the prey don't kill me. <laughs> Good luck. Buona fortuna. Crepi il lupo. Il lupo. Crepi il lupo. Crepi il lupo. Esatto. Uh, I hope the, the wolf is going to die. <laughs> okay. But are there specific Paleolithic cultures that you focus with your work? For now, no. I want to explore the whole Paleolithic uh, world. But uh, there are many cultures like the Gravettian or Magdalian that are very interesting, maybe in the future. What is the role of experimental archaeology in understanding of early human technologies? With the experimental archaeology, you understand the base of the technology of modern technology. With the stone tool, you can create another better stone tool. The Homo habilis started the technology of uh, Paleolithic. The handyman. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the Latin term for it. In your opinion, how does experimental archaeology complement traditional archaeology? 
Okay, with the experimental archaeology, you understand uh, much deeply they discover. For example, uh, there's a strange, uh, weird bone they found uh, and uh, they don't know how to use it. But uh, when you go into the experimental archaeology, you go into the process to recreate a genetic artifact, you can uh, discover something important with the experimental archaeology. Do you know maybe about Denisovans and their ability to make holes in a, in a stone bracelet that they made? Yes, the green oh, so, one. Yeah, the green one, exactly. I don't know how to explain on any language that I know what I feel when I see this. How did they do that? So tiny, so precise, so refined. Do you have any insights as an experimental archaeologist how they did it? For now, no. <laughs> okay. okay. The fact that they traveled, I think, maybe I'm lying, but let's say 300 kilometers away to find that specific stone and to bring it back and to drill it tells me something about them. Yeah. Yes? I think uh, if you find uh, a green rock, a green strange rock, uh, it must be something important because it's different of uh, any other you want uh, to bring uh, it back uh, to home, uh, the shelter, because strange uh, is unique. The same way with uh, the red ochre, yellow stone uh, that when you burn it, uh, turn into red. That will be some kind of magic. A green rock uh, must be important. Are you interested in making jewelry? Yes. I create uh, some stone uh, with a hole, uh, I drill it uh, to put on my neck. Are you going to sell those necklaces? No, 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 it's mine. <laughs> Are you okay, sorry. Okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> ah, another example uh, is a uh, earring uh, in, uh, in the podcast. They don't see it, but okay. Is a uh, earring uh, is a plug of uh, one centimeter. I take the yellow ochre. I burn it into red, and then with the flint, uh, I go to cut it because uh, the ochre is um, really soft, uh, the rock. Yes, uh, I modeling it and uh, make an earring. Cool. If Paleolithic people didn't know about sterilization, how did they did it? Uh, <laughs> this is a good question. <laughs> I don't know, maybe they tried to burn the, the tools before. Probably it was uh, a mistake in the first time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Have you ever experimented with the uh, Paleolithic music? Uh, not yet, but this is uh, one of my projects. For example, uh, I know that uh, there are a stone gong uh, in the British Museum. This is uh, very, very interesting. When you have this process of working, what do you feel when you do it? What are your insights? What do you think about cognitive abilities of Paleolithic people? Uh, okay, when uh, I take a breath uh, to the work, um, I always uh, think about what I'm doing. Uh, this is impressive. I feel uh, uh, there's a sense of... Uh, um, it's hard to, to explain. Uh, it's a sense of uh, even gratitude for uh, the legacy we, they left. I understand. What advices do you give to people who want to do Paleolithic experimental archaeology? Uh, okay, I suggest to break some rock. <laughs> Spend uh, energy and time uh, to break uh, a single uh, rock. Uh, you will understand uh, much more about uh, the Paleolithic era, the Paleolithic uh, style of life, uh, and uh, much more things. So I have this moral question. Do you have any ethical considerations that you take in account when you're conducting experiments in Paleolithic archaeology? I think with the Paleolithic, uh, it doesn't work because uh, Paleolithic uh, is uh, our culture. Yes, we got the same uh, root uh, in the Paleolithic uh, era, and uh, this uh, makes no sense for me. I don't know else what to tell you or ask you. Do you have anything else to add? No, we can finish. I'm a little bit hungry. Well, I cannot <laughs> help you there. Uh, thank you for being the second person that I interviewed. It was a pleasure for me. Ciao, Tomas. Ciao. 
This concludes this episode. We didn't know else what to say in this episode. I want to thank you for joining and listening. I hope I inspired you. I hope you learned something. The music is performed by my friend Sebastian. You can check his band Cadavra. The link is below. Enjoy the song. Until the next time. Goodbye. Thank you.